If this is your first season of breeding, there's certain items that you should already have on hand. So in this video, we're gonna do a checklist. We're gonna go over certain items that you should already have to get you ready just before you receive your very first clutch. Every single day. Hey guys, Ron here with BBM Reptiles. Thank you again for taking the time for stopping by my channel. And if you're new, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and follow me along in this incredible journey of reptile keeping, specifically working with ball pythons. Guys, we're already hitting um, the, the, the point of ovulation and we're close to egg dropping. So that season for me basically kicks off between now that most of my females already stopped um, or refuse feeding. And I would say within a month, I should start seeing my first ovulations going by past records that I've actually kept with other seasons. Um, but there's certain things during the time while I was breeding, I actually fine tuned to my needs and it actually helped me out. And I wanted to share some of those tips with you and things that you should have on hand. Now, obviously if you're this far and this is your first season, you already have an incubator. So once you already have your incubator, you wanna make sure that you actually start running it at least three to four weeks before the specific date that you expect that first dropping of the eggs. The reason is this is because you want to make sure that your thermometer and your, and your temperature within it is basically stable because let's say for example um, you bought a um, Vivarium Electronics or, um, or the other thermostats and you're basically setting it up and you notice that basically the heat tape is not connected the way it should be or um, it's actually getting too, more heat, too much heat than it needs. And you wanna make sure that basically everything is fine tuned. That's why I specifically would say that give it at least four to three weeks before the date that you think that you would have your first egg dropping because it's gonna give you that time to fine tune it. Now, basically things to help you fine tune it. For example, you would have to um, get one of these temp guns. These temp guns are great basically with this, um, what I like to do based specifically is I like to actually check each of the areas within the incubator to basically get an idea of how the temperature is running. And with that, um, I purchased basically these accurate um, thermometers and it's also, uh, um, it registers the humidities on the, or the inside of the incubator. And um, you can actually pick this up on Amazon. I mean, like, I think I paid like $6 and it came with a pair of two. So I bought lots of these. I think, as a matter of fact, I have about six of these. And also, it's also good to have backups because if basically one actually starts fading out or actually this, 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 they're, they're pretty good because I've had this already for two years and I haven't had to change the batteries. And like I said, I have six of them. And each one, the pair, you can get them on Amazon for about $7. This is great because with this and with the temp gun, it actually helps you um, check each of the areas and then basically you can actually verify the temperatures and it gives you that time to basically fine tune it just before you get that egg drop. So it's always good to basically work out at least three weeks to basically a month before when you expect um, to have that first clutch. Now, you just ball python, you woke up one morning because that's the other cool thing, just in case you haven't, um, if this is your very first season. Ball pythons, they usually drop their clutches in the morning. So have a good restful sleep. When you wake up in the morning and you check on them and you start seeing them pearly whites, give them at least two to three hours after that, basically, because that's when they actually start around six to seven o'clock. Usually that's the time that I've noticed them. And by 10 to 11, that's when they're more or less over. Very rarely, and I gotta tell you the truth, I've never in the years that I have been breeding seen a ball python, in my collection at least, um, lay their eggs after mid-afternoon. It's always in the morning. So um, maybe it's a locality thing, but the experience that I've seen, it's always in the morning. So you've seen your ball python, she dropped her eggs. You actually took the ball python off. The next thing you wanna do, or the next thing you have to have, is a cool flashlight. 
Now the flashlight, you're gonna need this because this flashlight is gonna candle the eggs. And this is another, I say, drift store, drift store um, novelty. This little flashlight, I picked it up for a dollar. You could actually get this in Walmart. And I bought like six of them. And the cool thing is basically if one actually doesn't work, I have more than extra ones, but these are great because candling the egg, that's when you start to see the veins within the, um, the, the, the ball python eggs. And you can actually find that little, um, I would say the air bubble. That's where you want to um, actually put the eggs inside the, um, the tub, which I'm gonna go into that next, but pick up a flashlight. The next thing, basically, first off, you're gonna get the temp guns, you're gonna get your, your thermometer registers, then you're gonna have your flashlight to have on hand. Wentz, basically, is gonna bring me over to the next thing to have. Obviously, we all know you're gonna need tubs. With the tubs, this is something that I like to do. Besides, basically, Putting the, the perlites, now I know there's different breeders, they use vermiculites, some even uses wet sponges. Um, during the years, I mean like, if it hasn't, if it doesn't broke, there's no need to fix it and basically I've had no problem. I use actually perlites. And um, I buy, as a matter of fact, like the big bag in Home Depot. You could get like a, a 10 pound bag depending how many um, babies or, or clutches you plan to have and you can always store it for future seasons and that actually works great. Now, I like to use a combination within a light diffuser. This is also something that you could get in Home Depot. And this little, I would say it's like a, what basically you would find in the arts and crafts section of Walmart. I mean, like, I'm, I guess I'm a constant shopper there. Um, you get these and you just basically cut them off and I like to put them up on top. And the reason why is Obviously, I'm gonna put the vermiculites inside the, the, the tub. And um, just in case you're wondering, um, usually they recommend, now this is a 16 ounce um, deli cup. Um, the portion is basically two portions of the, uh, the perlite with at least um, two portions of water. Um, that's the going rate, but basically as the season progresses, um, you basically know the measurement that you have to have. Uh, but just make sure that it's not extremely damp when you're actually combining the two. Um, but going back to the light diffuser and the other thing, once I actually have the, um, the perlites on, um, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the light diffuser on it. And the second thing I like to do is I like to put this, um, this grating. Actually, like I said, I think, I believe this is what they use for, for knitting. Um, and like I said, in the arts and crab area that they have the knitting yarns and the needle needles, you'll find these. So basically, I like to put it on top of that because that actually helps me when I actually start to put, um, some people, they like to use um, the golf tees. I use actually plastic forks. And I mean, like, it actually works so cool when I actually put it in and then I'll poke it in and I explain, I'll explain why I actually use this. But... Actually, I actually want to try to break this down as um, easy as I can. And um, the reason this is so great is because after the, the eggs actually start pipping or when I start cutting, I will remove the grail. I will remove the, the light diffuser and I will only leave this. And the reason why is because I've seen other breeders have problems that once the snakes actually come out of their eggs, they'll entwine um, between these light diffusers and they'll actually drag their yolk or their umbilical cord against this and sometimes they will bleed out. So basically the reason of this is to separate the water or the perlite, the, the humid perlite from actually touching the eggs and to guarantee it even more, um, this simple sheet over here. This is something else that I use. Now, going back to the humidity on this. Um, last season, this is something that I actually um, noticed and it was real real familiar or actually actually strange. If you know what perlite is, it's extremely dry. It is extremely, extremely dry. And since I saw so many people because so many breeders in, up in the States, they're a little bit more fortunate than me that they actually can breed year round. And when I see that basically that first person is dropping eggs, I get, a, I guess, um, a little bit excited and I start preparing all my tubs. Now, I, I will not put water. Basically, what I'll do is I'll put the perlite inside and I'll have it set. And obviously, I'll have the water. That's something else I wanted to say. Um, I will already have the water inside the incubator 
basically graduated to that temperature of 88 to 89 degrees. So it's already in there a month in advance. Um, so that way when I do actually mix the water with the, the perlite, the temperature will not drop drastically or even rise. It'll basically be stable. Now, it's going back to this, I've actually put this alone without water a month in advance. And when I went back to my incubator to actually check and take it out to actually put eggs in it, it was funny because the humidity with inside my incubator or basically where I live, it actually, I don't know how, but it actually got water droplets all over the tubs. And I didn't put water at all in this, but believe it or not, in the air, and I guess that's why some breeders, they actually have to have fans within their incubators to actually circulate the air so it's not dry air. Like I said, it's a locality thing. And I guess because where I live, it's extremely humid all season round, so I don't have that problem. And I do have a big incubator, and I build the fans in there just in case, but I've noticed that there's no need for the fans because the incubator, and it actually showed me myself when I put the perlite without water a month, when I went a month back, this whole tub was actually humid. Which goes back to basically why I use forks. Once you actually have eggs and you're actually setting them up in your egg tub, you want to actually make sure that you're spacing the eggs that are not touching the sides of the walls of the tub. And the reason is, is because if the egg is actually touching the side of the wall, the condensation of the water within the tub will actually drip down from the top of the tub and it'll run, run along the, the sides of the tubs. And if the egg is actually laid up against the tub, you will lose the egg because basically the eggs, the, when you actually touch them the very first time, they're real, real soft. They're kind of like a real light lettery touch. Um, but they actually can absorb water. They can absorb water and you can actually drown the embryo and you'll lose that egg. Um, I had a bad season once that one of my snakes, she actually laid her eggs inside the water bowl and she actually laid eight clutches. And this was a bamboo that I actually bred to a spinoblast. And that's when bamboo was like the, the highest it was at the peak of the season. And when I actually got that clutch and saw that I had six eggs in the water bowl, I, I, I lost it actually. And it, I was only able to save two. Now, I actually catch that pretty soon, but not soon enough. And that short time that she did lay the eggs inside that water bowl, it actually absorbed all the water. And even though I put in an incubator, I noticed during the time that it started kind of like leaking out. It was actually, or I would say, dropping a lot of droplets of water on the outside of the eggs. And something that someone told me basically, and I've, I've heard other breeders use it, is they'll actually sprinkle foot powder or there's like liquid bandage. And I actually went out and I bought liquid bandage and I actually applied it all around the eggs. It really didn't do anything because it already soaked in the water and that actually did the damage. That's why I actually use items to actually separate the eggs, even though there's not movements. Um, and I hope I'm not gonna have any movements. Um, earthquake, what I would say, um, but it's gonna make sure, again, make sure if I ever have to move a tub and place another one at any time, um, an egg will not roll over. And that's why basically I like to actually use plastic fork. Some people like to use um, the golf tees. Other thing that I've noticed, and I've actually been guilty because I've done it before, um, you'll see people that actually they'll use Q-tips. They use Q-tips and they'll put it basically as a space between eggs. And that's not a good idea. And I'll tell you why. Um, I myself noticed it. Even though eggs, a ball python eggs, they're extremely sturdy. I mean, like, I gotta say, I put ball python eggs to the test during my times, and I've been surprised how actually durable they are. But the thing is, if you actually space them with Q-tips, and because there's humidity growing inside the, the egg tub, you will get fungus. It will actually, I mean, like, wool and sticks because I even use bamboo sticks for you know the ones I would use for shish kebabs I even use those and in within a month or basically within a few weeks I started seeing black mold or the fungus actually form onto the sticks and sometimes it would go over to the eggs now like I said if you ever hatched um 
if you ever had a clutch and you had one bag egg and you can't pull it off because sometimes that will happen if you do reach it a little bit late, lo longer and the eggs actually attached itself to the other eggs, you can actually pry it off and you'll leave it on. And during, this, during the 45, 55, actually 60 days, 55 to 60 days, you notice that basically that moldy egg will not affect the other ones. It'll actually give it that bad coloration, but it won't affect it. But either way, you wanna actually control, at least it doesn't create such a large molding within the, um, within the tubs. And these are basically, these are magnets for molds. So try to stay away from Q-tips and use something plastic. And um, I don't have, and believe it or not, I mean, like I got a golf range, funny, it's a golf resort, like five minutes from my house. And I went to my local Walmart and they don't actually sell those golf, um, the golf tees. So the next best thing for me is basically forks. And the reason is because basically it has a prongs there. And I just like to, what I do is I'll just cut it. Let me see if I can actually, this is, it helps me cut. Um, I'll basically cut it just like that and um, I will space the eggs with the forks. So um, a pack of these will run you like for dollars. So basically I, I got like uh, 200 forks. I'm expecting a lot of clutches this season, but these are good spaces that I like to actually put between the eggs. It's real important that with this, what you're doing is you're avoiding that the egg gets to actually touch the side of the walls. Now, the other cool thing to have basically is obviously a scale. These scales are really good because besides measuring the weight of the eggs that you just dropped from the ball pythons, it's also basically good to actually get an idea what your ball python weight is after she dropped those eggs. So it'll give you an idea if you can actually go with that female the following season and how, how quickly she can either rest or how quickly you should actually start her out with meals, which should bring me to the next thing is obviously you have to have a notebook. The reason behind the notebook is there's so many important informations and I understand with the excitement of having your very first clutch, you might forget certain things in future seasons and that's why it's really important to keep a log. You wanna keep a log of when that female dropped her first clutch because if you plan on using that female the following season, Sometimes they will follow a schedule or routine when they more or less will drop the eggs. And sometimes they will basically either delay themselves or even go before us. But it's a good thing to basically keep logs. And obviously you wanna know where they're pairing so you can have a good lineage of what future breedings you can have from that very first clutch. It's a lot more easier when you're starting your very first time and your limited amount of clutches that you have versus if you have at least over a hundred snakes and you're trying to catch up with everything past seasons and starting getting all that information. So if you're starting off for the very first time and this will be your first clutch, or even if this is your second or your third season, you're still within time to make good records of those ball pythons because in this, this is a long lasting hobby and um, there will be things that you will actually benefit from what you actually put down in the book. So really important, keep logs. Another thing obviously that I like to have is these label tabs. If you don't have the benefit of actually printing them out on your computer, I'm not computer savvy basically, so I'm not really that good at printing um, clutch cards. So what I like to do is I like to actually buy these labels. They're like 99 cents in the Dollar Tree stores. And with this, I like to basically identify the tubs to let me know what the pairing, the due date and the late date of that specific clutch. That way I'm not always constantly open the um, incubator door and checking on the eggs. Um, I know some breeders basically, they like to um, put, I would say plastic, um, plastic wrap on top of their, their tubs and air it out every two, three weeks because where I am in my locality basically, and it does get extremely humid, I try not to open it at all. I'll just let it go the full 60 days and then that's basically I will open up. They will get their air every time I open up the door to place another clutch in there. So the air within the, the incubator will be circulating. Um, but then again, going back to the labels, it's only 99 cents and it's a good thing day 60 to have extra and you can basically slap it on the tubs of basically what the clutches that you're gonna actually have. Now, 
We already have your clutch. We already have it all set up in the in the egg box, the ready incubator, and we're going to the 55, 60 days. Now, I know there's always that issue about cutting or pipping and what side are you? I mean, like I actually got hate from people because I cut and they actually see it in my video. Listen guys, I mean like, let's be real, real honest. Ball pythons are real, real sturdy and there's nothing specifically written in stone. And if you decide to let pip or if you decide to cut, that's all on you. That's your personal experience. And don't go by what other people actually will tell you. Go by what you feel is more comfortable for you. And obviously for the snakes. And But I got to tell you, honestly, with all honesty, there is no disadvantage of cutting. And I know that by experience because I've actually cut and I let some pip. And I feel, me personal, my personal opinion, that if I decide to cut, um, it's because I want to give that ball python more than 100% survival of actually coming out. Because I'm not going to leave it to chance. Because if I actually took two snakes and I bred them myself, I already intervened at that very beginning. So they're not, they're not basically in the wild. They are captive bred. So crafted bread means that I'm not going to leave it to chance. I'm going to make sure I'm going to give them every possibility to actually come out of that eggs. And which is why I'm going to go back to certain things that is also good to have. Um, there was, there is a video, there's a video, um, on, on YouTube about basically when you have a ball python that drags their um, umbilical cord, sometimes they will die if they actually have it attached. And what's gonna happen is it's gonna bend to a point that obviously none of the fluid's gonna make it into the ball python and the ball python will die. And I was fortunate enough to see a video from Brian Gundy about five years ago when actually he, um, he had a ball python where the, um, the umbilical cord was actually out and he had to tie it up. And watching that video at that early stage, actually, I didn't even expect I would experience that. But watching that video, I use it as a reference. And because I had a local mentor that also went through that same situation, he helped me out and I seen it firsthand besides watching the video, what to do. I'm going to put the link of Brian Gundy's video of that specific situation, but because of that and, and because of that, I was actually use, was able to use that as a reference for these other things to, to actually have on hand, which actually helped me in other seasons. I had a ball python, at least I, I, I had this like two times actually, two or three, no, two times, that actually wouldn't come out the egg. Even though the clutch mates did come out the eggs, there was always one that was kind of a little bit slow. And when I looked, I actually cut it up a little bit more. I noticed that the yolk was actually hard. And obviously, um, when I talked to my friends about this or one of my mentors, he explained to me that I had to cut it. And he was the one that referenced Brian Gundy's um, channel. So with that, basically, I was able to take the ball python out and I was actually able to cut the umbilical cord. Now with that, obviously, going back to the cutter pip, if you're a cutter, you're already gonna have a scissors on hand. And if you're not a cutter, get one anyway. I mean like heck, you never know. You're gonna buy some scissors and it's also good to have dental floss on hand. And this is, this is a lifesaver, um, sodium chloride. This is sodium chloride solution. This is basically, I would say it's a lot more cleaner, 10 times more cleaner than sterile water. As a matter of fact, store, um, sodium chloride is what they actually put on you when you're actually in the ER in the emergency room and they'll, cook, they'll hook you up to IVs. This is the, the liquid actually that pumps through your vein. This is actually what maintains your blood vessels open so they can have an open line within your veins to, if they ever have to put any type of medication. So if it's that clean to go within, within your body, um, this is the perfect thing to actually use. So when you do have that situation that you have to do an extra um, hand for the ball python specifically, when you had to cut the, um, the umbilical cord and you're gonna tie it off with the, with the dental floss, what I like to do is instead of putting water, I will put um, this solution in the bottom of the egg tub that I'll have until that ball python drops um, 
that string that I tied onto. And basically when it gets its first shed. So this is the water that I use instead of distilled water. Um, I'll buy this and this is basically like $3. You won't be able to pick this up in a Walgreens or CVS, but you could go to a regular pharmacy and you can actually ask for this and they'll sell it to you with no problem. Um, this is really great. And also this works, for example, if you notice that your eggs, um, after you cut, they dried out instead of putting water, you can actually put this inside. You could put this inside the eggs and I've actually done that also. That if I had an egg when I cut and it's a little bit too dry, I will put this inside and it's a saver. Again, this is sodium chloride. You could pick this up in any pharmacy. You won't find it in a Walgreens or a CVS. You have to go to basically a regular for, uh, pharmacy and ask for one of these. So again, dental floss and Sodium chloride. Hopefully you won't have to use it, but then again, it's better having it on hand instead of actually running out the last minute. And this is other thing that I actually like to keep inside my incubator. So when I pull it out and if I need it, it's already graduated to the temperature that's inside the incubator. So basically that ball python will not have like a shock when um, she'll actually be um, put cold water or cold solution onto it. So Guys, more or less, this is this is a basic idea of things that you should have on hand that it will help you out. Basically, a lot of these things, it's it's to the benefit basically of you as a first time and you can actually tweak it out. And if there's anything additional that you think that that would be um, needed, go ahead and put it in the comment field because someone who's watching this video and it's going to go to the comment, they'll probably see and they can apply it to themselves. And heck, even I can apply it. Um, but these are basically basic things that it's good to have on hand just before you get that egg dropping. And so you can actually have a great experience when you get your very first clutch. Well, guys, again, thank you very much. And I know I did ramble on a little bit longer. Maybe I talked more than I should have. But these are basic things that I feel that you might benefit adding on if you already don't have it. Um, one extra thing can actually help you out. So again, thank you again for stopping by. And again, for those people that are stopping by the first time in my channel, if you can take the time and subscribe, um, this is gonna be a great ride um, within the hobby. And something that I've noticed is there's always a time that there's like the lows and the highs within the hobbies. And I've actually seen there's like a big influence or a big flush of a lot of people that's actually coming into the community. And um, that only means, and I said it in so many videos, that this is a very, very strong hobby and it's a great, great community to be part of. So again, take the dive, join in. And if this is your first time and you're watching this video, welcome to this great world. Again, thank you very much. And then if you haven't subscribed, go ahead and hit, hit that subscribe button. Leave whatever your comments you want. And until the next time, guys, I'll see you in the next video.